Thank you very much, everyone, for uh, being here. Uh, this is an event we're uh, naming Remembering the Tragic Arecibo Telescope Collapse and Advocating for its Future. Um, it's being brought to you by uh, the Arecibo Science and Advocacy Partnership, or ASAP, or ASAP. Um, as you know, we are here to uh, commemorate the one-year anniversary of the collapse of the Arecibo Telescope. And uh, we'll have, uh, I'll give you a brief introduction on what ASAP is, the uh, organization that is um, uh, organizing this. Then we'll have the keynote speaker, will be, which will be Don Campbell. And then uh, we'll talk, of you a few, uh, talk um, uh, about a few things that we're um, doing uh, in order to advocate for the future of uh, the observatory. So ASAP, uh, again, uh, the Arecibo Science Ad Advocacy Partnership was a grassroots organization that was uh, created more than 10 years ago uh, to support the Arecibo Observatory and advocates for its uh, science. ASAP has recently been reinvented with the goal to deal with the observatory's uh, current situation, which you probably know, following last year's uh, tragic collapse, which were you know, one year to the date today. Um, ASAP now has almost 500 members and for the first time has an elected board uh, with um, two representatives from each of the three sciences uh, represented at the uh, Arecibo Observatory, that is radio astronomy, radar planetary sciences, and uh, ironomy. Uh, we also have a board of officers for the first time. Uh, I am one of the radio astronomy representatives and the current uh, board chair, and Anne Verke, uh is uh, one of the representatives from the planetary sciences and is the incoming chair. I will be introducing the other elected board members throughout the event. Uh, but before we go to the keynote uh, speaker, I wanted to say that uh, ASAP is uh, made of four different committees, each with its own chair. There's the Advocacy and Outreach Committee, which advocates for the future of the observatory and, and to share its importance with the scientific community, the policy and decision makers and the community leaders uh, and the general public alike. Um, I will talk about some of the uh, things that uh, the Advocacy Committee is doing after Don's talk. There's the Puerto Rico Li Liaison Committee, which uh, is tasked with the maintaining a strong communication between radio scientists in Puerto Rico and ASAP and to ensure the interests of the voices, uh, interests and voices of Puerto Rican scientists and Puerto Rican stakeholders are clearly heard. There's the Arecibo 2.0 Committee, which explores uh, plans for rebuilding the uh, observatory, uh, keeping in mind the needs of all the three that traditional science areas, like I said, uh, radio astronomy, planetary radar, and ironomy. And there's a tech and administra administration committee which manages the ASAP media sources, the, web me the website, uh, social media, et cetera, and membership. Um, I will, again, uh, give a summary of some of the current activities after Don's talk. Uh, but if you're interested now in joining us and, and helping with our efforts, uh, please go to our website. Nick, uh, Nicole, can you uh, please put in the uh, link? For the sign-up sheet if people are interested in signing up for uh, any of the committees or just interested in getting uh, emails from ASAP. Uh, you can do that uh, going to our website and Nicole's going to put that in the chat. But now I'll give the floor to Eliana Nosa Gonzalez, which is one of the other elected board members uh, representing the Aronomy uh, side of things, who will introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Don Campbell. Eliana? Hello, everyone. Welcome. It is an honor for me to introduce Don Campbell today. I have to thank Don because he was the one that opened the doors for me into the astronomy department and the Arecibo Observatory when I joined Cornet. With his smile, he welcomed me as part of his lab before I moved to the PhD in engineering studying iron ionosphere, where he continues supporting me as part of my advisor community. As to all his students, Don introduced me to the radio sciences and taught me to love Arecibo. And that is something that characterizes Don. He radiated his love for Arecibo to everyone crossing his way. And you know, it became contagious. Don was the Arecibo director from 82 to 87 and NAIC director from many years after. He is recognized for his contributions to planetary science. In fact, he is the father of the planetary defense program at Arecibo. He made the first asteroid detection using the 430 megahertz radar. And this is an example of how he was a promoter of the Arecibo versatility. 
The 430 Hz megahertz radar was the ISR, traditionally used to study the ionosphere, but don't use it for asteroid detection, for planetary maps, or for searching water on the moon. Don also contributed to heliophysics, who was the first one to use Arecibo as a solar radar, and since then, many aeronomers, including me, have asked for his advice. Don had impacted every aspect of Arecibo radio science. He knows the science that Arecibo could perform, as well as the instrument itself. He dreamed of upgrades that could make Arecibo science better, like alpaca. Then, in behalf of our SAP board, it is a pleasure for me to introduce Don as a speaker to remember Arecibo and to project its future. Please help me to welcome Don. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Eliana. I very much appreciate the, the introduction. <laughs> um, and um, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are, to, uh, to everybody who's, um, who's listening. And so um, I'm going to, uh, you know, on, on this first anniversary of the collapse of the William E. Gordon Arecibo Telescope, it's, very, it's a very appropriate moment to remember the history of the telescope and its 57 years of tremendous contributions to the field of radio astronomy, planetary science, and ionospheric physics. Many of you had a long association with the observatory, either as staff members or users. Uh, for me, coming to Arecibo was the beginning of a lifetime involvement with the observatory and, of course, Cornell University, which built and managed the observatory until 2011. I'll always remember the dedicated staff who maintained all, spec all aspects of the observatory and, mainly, and the mainly expatriate um, staff and students who um, who, especially in the early days, came not just from the US, from such places as Australia, Europe, India, and Brazil. They made the observatory a really interesting place to work with winter. Work. With winter coming on, I very much remember the warm weather, great beaches, and welcoming people of Puerto Rico. I'm going to give a brief history of the construction and evolution of the telescope and some of its achievements. Since there's limited time, I can only cover a very small number of the research results, and I apologize to anyone whose research is, uh, has not been mentioned. And so I'll share my screen, hopefully. Okay. And so I'm just gonna talk about, uh, say, the history and uh, some of the achievements of the, of the, of the telescope. Um, in, uh, <clears throat> on May 29th of 1958, uh, William E. Gordon gave a uh, seminar at uh, Cornell. He was professor of electrical engineering in the Department of Engineering and gave a seminar um, on that day in which he outlined uh, his uh, plans for studying the Earth's ionosphere um, by bouncing uh, radar signals off the free electrons in the, in, in the ionosphere. Um, the, uh, to do this, he calculated the, recalculated, I think more correctly, the cross-section of the of electron. He made estimates of what the uh, electron density would be at, high altitudes in the ionosphere, and he assumed a 15 kilometer uh, height resolution. And from that, he came up with the specifications for the radar system that would be needed. And he was going to be, he needed a thousand foot uh, or 305 meter uh, diameter radio telescope. Um, and he needed a high powered transmitter with a peak power of uh, at least a megawatt or so. Um, and so with this, and this is what we're looking at here is the agenda of the, uh, of the meeting. Uh, he planned to measure the electron density and electron temperature as a function of height and time, law levels in the Earth's ionosphere up to heights of one or more Earth radii. He wanted to measure the uh, auroral ionizations that, uh, 
and of course, depended where the telescope was going to end up. Um, he wanted to detect transient streams of charged particles coming from outer space and exploring ring time uh, currents. But you know, what was also important uh, that he realized that the radar system could be used to study the, uh, study the planets, especially the, uh, potentially the sun even, the nearby planets of Venus and Mars and possibly Jupiter and uh, Mercury. And of course, he also realized that in these early days of radio astronomy, that this would be a significant continent, this telescope would contribute significantly to that uh, new field. Um, however, Gordon's assumption was that the, uh, the scatter would be from individual uh, electrons in the ionosphere, what's called incoherent scatter, and that, and that the bandwidth of the received echoes would reflect the, um, uh, the, the electron temperatures, in other words, their velocities. Uh, however, a former graduate student um, and that would give uh, bandwidths in the hundreds of kilohertz. However, a former graduate student at Cornell, uh, Ken Bowles, who was in at the National Bureau of Standard, used the um, used a 41 megahertz radar system that the NBS had at, in Illinois to obtain an incoherent scatter from the F region of the ionosphere, region of maximum uh, electron density, uh, in the fall of 1958. Um, the incoherent scatter echo that he that he detected had pretty much the same properties as predicted by uh, Gordon, with one exception that the bandwidth was much narrower than that predicted by Gordon. Um, and it turns out that if the uh, <clears throat> if the wavelength is uh, much larger than the electron spacing then you would get bunching of the electrons um, in the vicinity of the ions and, uh, and that the bandwidth would actually, if the received echo would actually reflect the ion velocities, not the electron velocities. That was good news. It would allow the ion composition to be measured, but uh, the much smaller antenna, but of course the sensitivity would be much higher since the uh, sensitivity goes as the inverse square root of the bandwidth. And so the whole system could, in fact, in theory, have been much smaller to meet uh, Gordon's basic requirements. However, neither Cornell nor the future funding agency and uh, advanced research project agency of the Department of Defense had much interest in building a small antenna. And so the decision was just to move ahead with the, with the thousand foot antenna. Um, the large size, of course, great benefit future radio astronomical planetary radar and uh, atmospheric studies. Um, Sorry, I'm having trouble. Ah. The um, construction started in a little over two years in uh, September of 1960. And this was made possible the fact that Cornell had some very good structural engineering faculty, especially George Winter and William McGuire. Um, the desire to observe the planets with a fixed parabolic antenna meant that it had to be in the tropics. Uh, Cornell faculty member Don Belcher was an expert on landforms, basically on remote sensing, and selected the site in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico was chosen because of its karst terrain, lots of sinkholes, close to the equator, and it was a politically stable uh, U.S. territory. Um, the Advanced Research Project Agency of the Department of Defense, which was a new agency which had lots of, lots of money, frankly, and um, it was looking for interesting projects that would mesh with this mission. And interest in the ionosphere was high at the beginning of the nuclear missile and space stage. Um, the basic requirements of the telescope were the vertical looking parabolic antenna, 1,000 feet in diameter, enough steerability to track the sun and terrestrial planets for the round trip light time of a radar signal, 32 minutes for the sun, 10 minutes for Venus, and the frequency was going to be close to 400 megahertz, mainly dictated by the uh, availability of klystrons at uh, that frequency. 
and uh, that set the RMS accuracy required of the wire mesh reflector at about two inches or five centimeters. Uh, image here of, uh, shows Bill Gordon and William McGuire uh, with the uh, uh, model of the, of the parabolic uh, wire mesh reflector and it has a central 500 foot tower. The, uh, the, uh, on the right is the, shows the top of the tower, the horns that can move in and out radially and rotate around the top of the tower in order to be able to track up to around 10 beam widths from the, uh, uh, from the vertical. Um, but around March of 59, it was decided to, uh, to make use of a spherical uh, primary reflector instead. Um, the advantages of primary reflector is it would allow pointing of the telescope up to 20, up to the 20 degrees from the vertical giving about two and a half hours of tracking for celestial bodies. This will make the telescope much more effective for radio and radio astronomical applications. The disadvantage is that you need a corrector for the spherical aberration. Uh, a spherical antenna will not focus the incoming, an incoming play wave to a point. Uh, it will do, it will partially focus it, but you need a, some sort of a corrector to complete the task of focusing and um, focusing an incoming wave. No such correct had ever been built for a big telescope. So it was a major gamble on the part of um, uh, everyone, the funding agency and, the, uh, and, uh, and William Gordon in order to, uh, to move to a spherical reflector. Um, <clears throat> a proposal was made to uh, ARPA, Advanced Research Project Agency, in June of 59, the $4.5 million in order to build the, uh, the radar system. And uh, ARPA agreed to support the project in late September of 59. So the whole time from the original concept to uh, getting funding was only about 18 months, totally inconceivable in, uh, in modern times. Uh, competition was held for the design of the telescope. Uh, and the, uh, Successful design was proposed by Thomas Kavanagh of the Von Seb Consortium. It was a consortium of several companies that had capabilities in the different areas that would be required. Um, and as you can see, it looks extremely similar to the telescope that uh, was actually finally, uh, finally built. Uh, for those of you who have been to the, tele to the uh, structure using either the cable car or the catwalk, the rather scary part about uh, this system is that in order to get to the suspended structure, you had to take a, you had to take a, um, <clears throat> a uh, elevator up tower T8, which turned out to be the tallest of the towers, and catch a cable car uh, from the top of T8 over to the structure. Fortunately, saner minds prevailed, and during the detailed design of the, you know, the, uh, of the system a catwalk and cable car was, uh, was, in, was included. I wanted to recognize a number of the very early people. In the summer of uh, 1960, Bill Gordon and his family moved to Arecibo in order to supervise the construction and to set up an office to uh, build the data acquisition and, uh, and processing uh, systems. Um, he was accompanied by four uh, Cornell-related families. Um, the top center is uh, George Peter, who had been working on uh, the Cornell Radio Astronomy Program for a number of years. Um, he remained with NEIC, Arecibo and NEIC until he retired. On the lower right is Tom Talpy, who was a Cornell graduate who worked for Bell Labs and uh, Bill Gordon persuaded him to come to our receiver and work on the receivers and receiving systems. Uh, the upper right is uh, Merle Lalonde, who was a Cornell graduate also, who had worked with Bill Gordon and, uh, and was one of the most uh, you know, important people uh, working uh, for our receiver in the early years as a liaison with the contractors initially. Merle Till turned his hand to ionospheric uh, studies um, once the telescope was completed. 
And he also in, then built the uh, succession of line feeds uh, for, for the telescope. Uh, on the upper left is uh, Miguel Feijo, who was the first um, engineer from Puerto Rico hired in uh, February of 1961. Miguel was a brilliant, uh, brilliant electronics engineer who went on to head the um, electronics department, the observatory for many, many years. And below uh, to the left is uh, Domingo Albino talking to uh, Bill Gordon. Uh, Domingo was hired a few months after Miguel Feijo <coughs> to be in charge of the 430 megahertz uh, transmitting system and worked for the observatory until, um, until he retired. Uh, construction work commenced in September of 1960, and I'm not going to talk about all the travails and details of the construction. Uh, the schedule that had the, observe, had the telescope been completed by mid of 1961, just in time to uh, observe Venus uh, in the fall, at its close approach to the Earth in the fall of 1961. Uh, As you can see, that was an incredibly optimistic schedule. Um, and the telescope was not uh, completed till late in 1963. Uh, and personally, I regard that, even that, as a pretty fast uh, uh, schedule, given the tremendous logistical and other problems associated with building uh, such a huge uh, structure um, in, uh, in a sinkhole um, um, in uh, South of, south of Arecibo. Um, this is the inauguration, was on number 163, and this just shows the original sinkhole and the finished uh, telescope with this wire mesh reflector. And up right there is Bill Gordon looking very happy and very relieved, I'm sure, that uh, the that, uh, that, uh, telescope was finally in operation and that he could turn to the science that he uh, envisaged uh, for it. The, um, the original uh, corrector was a 96 foot long square tapered slotted waveguide. And just so you can see it being lifted to the telescope in uh, late 63. Um, it was designed by, it built, designed and built by the TRG Corporation in Boston um, and but sadly, it didn't work very well. It had an aperture efficiency of only 22 percent, where which, and the efficiency was supposed to be over 50 over 50 percent. Um, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and the uh, and the beam shape that you can see on the right there uh, clearly had very large uh, near in near in side lobes. However, by a stroke of electromagnetic luck, uh, the polarization properties of the beam were actually quite good. Um, and of course, for a radar system, you want to be able to transmit a circularly polarized wave and preferably receive both circular polarizations. And the isolation between the circular polarizations was about 20 dB, factor of 100. And so in fact, quite, uh, quite good. So the main impact um, of the Poor performance uh, was the beam shape, which affected your build, the radio astronomy's ability to uh, to image to image large extended sources, um, and the loss in uh, loss in sensitivity. But in fact, um, it worked extremely well. This, on the left is the one of the early electron density profiles showing a very no noiseless profile all the way out to 550 kilometers. And so uh, Bill Gordon must have been very happy uh, with this particular result. Um, back in the, these 1963, 64, was still very early days of computing and it wasn't possible. Digital systems didn't exist in order to form the, uh, the spectra um, of the echoes from different altitudes, uh, different heights in the ionosphere. And so an analog system uh, had been ordered uh, from the Raceband Corporation. It didn't work uh, very well until about the summer of 1964. 
that's shown here are just for uh, six spectra at different heights in the ionosphere that um, it's relatively narrow at 300 kilometers um, where the ion composition is dominated by uh, singly ionized oxygen. Uh, as you move up in altitude, uh, the, uh, you begin to see a little bit of helium coming in. And then around 450 kilometers, you see ionized uh, hydrogen protons coming in. The, the wings of the uh, spectra are broadening out and then the whole spectrum tends to broaden out. And by the time you get to 100 kilometers, uh, it's almost entirely uh, ionized hydrogen. This work was done by Herb Carlson, who was a graduate student uh, at Arecibo at the time, and Bill Gordon. Uh, for radar astronomy, um, uh, Venus came in, uh, became observable with Arecibo in February of 64, just a few months after the telescope was completed. And the, um, <clears throat> and was immediately detected. Um, the, uh, then in the summer during Venus's close approach to the earth, a series of spectra, uh, spectral broadening measurements were made that allowed you to compute the rotation period. It was known that Venus had a retrograde rotation, uh, but this plot uh, allowed a, but the, the rotation period was not that well known. And uh, these data gave a period of 247 plus or minus five days. And that was within the, uh, uh, the era bars of the current uh, value of 243 days. Um, and similar observations to made of Mercury in, uh, in uh, April of 1965. Um, it was long thought that Mercury was in a synchronous rotation um, with its 88 uh, day orbital period about the sun. Uh, these early measurements showed that in fact that the uh, rotation period was 59 days. Um, and of course the dynamicists fairly quickly realized that the, based on the elliptical orbit of Mercury about the sun, that, uh, that uh, its rotation period should be two thirds of the, of the orbital period and very close to 59 days. For radio astronomy, um, there were some initial uh, observations of the planets, um, but the main focus was on looking at uh, the structure of small sources. And that was done by lunar occultations and also by uh, interplanetary scintillations. Um, and this is just showing you a lunar occultation of a source 1101 plus 11, which clearly has two peaks in the diffraction pattern corresponding to a source, a double source with components separated by just nine arc seconds. And the work was done by uh, Marshall Cohen and um, Mugu. Mugu in, 19, in, 1960, in June of 1964. Uh, it was a discovery of pulsars by Jocelyn Bell in 1967 that dramatically changed the radio astronomy program. Arecibo was perfect for the study of pulsars, not just because of its very high sensitivity given its size, but also because it had the equipment needed to, uh, to study pulses. It didn't matter whether they were pulses from the ionosphere, radar pulses from coming back from the ionosphere or a planet, or whether they were pulsar pulses. Uh, it had the high-speed digitization systems and, uh, that, and almost no other radio, astro radio astronomy observatory uh, was equipped. They just didn't need high-speed uh, digitization. Um, Frank Drake, who was the observatory director at the time, picture of Frank adjusting the chart recorder, I think, um, about 1968, um, redirect some graduate, graduate students into this new field. And two of the early achievements was the measurement of the, two of the early achievements was the measurement of the 33 millisecond period of the Crab Nebula Pulsar in 1968. Uh, this verified, the very short, verified Tom Gold's then controversial theory that pulsars were neutron stars. Uh, it had long been, it had been thought that pulsars were probably pulsating stars, probably white dwarf uh, stars. With the 30, that was not possible with a period of only 33 milliseconds. 
Um, this was done by uh, John Camell and Howard Craft, Richard Lovelace, all graduate students at the time, and John Sutton, who was a staff scientist who had joined the uh, observatory from Australia in 1965. The second discovery, major discovery, of course, was the first uh, pulsar binary system by Russell Holtz and Joseph Tell in 1974, for which they received the Nobel Prize. It wasn't long after the uh, completion of the telescope that people started to think about improvements. Um, the desire was to be able to go to much higher frequencies than the limit set by the wire mesh uh, irregularities in the wire mesh uh, surface that um, limited the maximum frequency to about 600 megahertz or so. Um, but uh, in order to <clears throat> but it was clear from the potential funding agencies, um, primarily uh, ARPA and, uh, and most importantly, the National Science Foundation, which took over ownership of the observatory on October 1 of 1969, um, and, they, and was not willing to fund a uh, new surface made of aluminum panels with much better accuracy than the wire mesh surface, unless it could be demonstrated that line feeds could be built that would efficiently uh, illuminate uh, the telescope. Um, there were two, two uh, efforts on this, uh, one by Alan Love of uh, the Ordnetics Division of, uh, um, and by, it was, uh, contracted to build a 606 megahertz uh, flat waveguide feed. And the flat waveguide feed solved a number of the problems associated with the, uh, with the square waveguide feed, circularly polarized square wave, waveguide feed. Disadvantages of, the, of a flat feed is that it's sensitive to only one linear polarization. However, um, well, uh, Alan Love proceeded with the design of a of a 45 foot long uh, uh, flat waveguide feed that would eliminate 750 feet of the surface. And at the same time, Earl Lalonde decided he would build one at around 318 megahertz. And um, it was uh, 40 feet long, eliminating 700 feet of the surface. Uh, that one was finished in 1968, went onto the telescope um, and worked uh, perfectly. It gave an average efficiency in, ex in excess of 70%, which is very satisfactory. Um, Alan Love's feed was finished in 69 and didn't give quite as high an aperture efficiency because of the YMS irregularities of the YMS surface, but worked, worked up to expectations. This uh, opened the door to getting funding from the National Science Foundation uh, for the uh, for the resurfacing of the reflector. I'd like to add that Alan Love uh, also came up with a incredibly um, imaginative design uh, for the circularly for circularly polarized uh, line feed at 430 megahertz, and that that was actually completed in uh, and put under the telescope in 1972 and. Uh, And again, I'm not going to go into the details of the uh, of the uh, resurfacing of the uh, of the telescope. Um, it uh, it consisted of 338,778 aluminum panels, uh, which would allow and would allow operation up to about five gigahertz, dictated by in this case the RMS errors of the uh, just the setting of the panels was something like about 3.2 uh, millimeters. Um, NASA had agreed to put up $3 million to put a 420 kilowatt CW trans transmitter at 2.38 gigahertz on the telescope at the same time. And it was primarily uh, uh, for planetary radar observations and especially for the imaging of the surface of Venus. In theory, you could actually image, you could image Venus with a resolution down to around two kilometers or so uh, with this new system. And you can see the people getting ready to install the, 38, the last of the 38,778 panels on the telescope in uh, late 1974. 
Um, I want to backtrack a little bit and just mention uh, one other major initiative uh, that took place. Um, Bill Gordon and others had a strong interest in, um, in uh, using transmitted HF, uh, H high frequency wave. High frequency in this case means somewhere in the sort of uh, uh, <clears throat> five to 12 megahertz uh, range to study nonlinear effects in the, uh, in the ionosphere. Um, the, this was a case of not just studying the ionosphere, but actually experimenting with the ionosphere. Uh, a borrowed 20 HF transmitter at about 160 kilowatts was, uh, was obtained. Initially, a Yagi antenna at six megahertz was put up, hung from the center of the suspended structure and was quickly replaced by a inverted log periodic antenna that covered the five megahertz to 12 megahertz uh, range of frequencies. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> however, that uh, was used for a number of years, but there was a desire to build a dedicated transmitting uh, facility and a location was chosen in a marshy region just east of Arecibo in Puerto Rico, uh, close to the coast. And uh, this facility that you can see in the right-hand image was, uh, was built and consisted of 32 inverted log periodic antennas operating uh, again over a two to 12 megahertz range and was fed by 400 kilowatt transmitters. This was a major task on the part of the observatory. This was a mosquito infested area and uh, that had been drained uh, and pumped out to lower it to about three feet below uh, uh, sea level. So that, uh, so that uh, you could actually, originally the intention I think was to uh, grow, uh, grow rice there. Uh, the system was used uh, with great success uh, until the uh, late 1990s when the, there was environmental movement that wanted to revert the whole area to a, to a marshland. And then in late 19, in September of 1998, Hurricane Georges came through uh, that severely damaged the, uh, the whole installation. And it was uh, finally uh, uh, disbanded. Um, turning to radar astronomy, the uh, objective of the initial objective was to image the surface of Venus and uh, this was done during close approaches of the planet to the Earth in 1975 and 77. And the image you're looking at covered about a third of the surface of the planet. Um, the resolution was in the sort of 10 to 15 kilometer range, um, but that was enough to actually identify many features on the surface, such as impact craters, uh, volcanoes, uh, tectonic features, and of course, there are many other features. It wasn't clear uh, what their actual uh, origin was. This was the first large scale image of the surface of uh, this planet uh, looking through its uh, dense cloud cover. Um, the um, <clears throat> a graduate student, uh, Barbara Burns, working, uh, working with me, uh, counted craters and found that the age of the surface of the planet was only about 600 million years. Uh, in other words, that this planet was resurfaced by generally by volcanic and tectonic processes uh, over, the, over that time period. Um, and uh, that was verified by the Magellan uh, mission to Venus a number of years later. Uh, in 1982, there was the discovery of the first millisecond pulsar by Don Bakker, Sri Kulkarni, et cetera. Um, and that uh, was an extremely important discovery. Um, the telescope was now sensitive to the 1.4 megahertz, uh, gigahertz uh, radiation from atomic hydrogen in external galaxies. And um, Martha Haynes and Riccardo Giovanelli um, uh, set about to, uh, to map out the, an area of the local universe called the Pisces Perseus uh, supercluster. Uh, which was a long elegated structure in just optical observations that you can see at the top, uh, which is just a right ascension declination image. But of course, with the uh, uh, <clears throat> looking at the spectral line of hydrogen, you could actually measure the Doppler shift and that translates into knowing the distance. 
And so the bottom plot shows you the uh, velocity or distance as a function of uh, right ascension along the persuasive um, uh, uh, supercluster. And this was the is uh, master, uh, uh, <clears throat> Ricardo and uh, Martha received the Henry Draper Medal for this work with a citation for the first three dimensional view of some of the remarkable large scale filamentary structure of our visible universe. 1992, Alex Walshen, a staff scientist at Arecibo, uh, discovered the first planets about a star, the first exoplanets. Uh, it wasn't about a normal star, it was about a pulsar, but nonetheless, this, these were the first uh, exoplanets ever, ever, uh, ever uh, discovered. And for that, Alex received the Beatrice Sindley Prize from the American Astronomical Society in 1996. And since he was of Polish origin, uh, the Polish, uh, Polish government uh, issued a stamp uh, uh, with his image on it. Um, and so in the 1980s and 90s, uh, uh, the uh, thoughts, late 70s actually, the thoughts turned to what we, how to improve the telescope further. Line feeds are intrinsically narrow band so there's no need to, but so you need to build one uh, for every uh, every new frequency that you want to uh, utilize. Uh, the difficult build of frequencies above around three gigahertz just due to tolerance issues, and you get significant increase in the system temperature and hence reduction in sensitivity uh, once the illuminated area spills off the edge of the reflector and you start to get thermal emission from the surrounding uh, terrain. Um, the solution was to do a spherical aberration correction with mirrors, a wavelength independent. And Frank Drake, uh, who was the NAIC director at the time in the late 1970s, did an initial study of an offset dual reflector system. Um, studied, uh, issued a report in 1980. And then Tor Hagpers, after he was appointed the NAIC director in 1982, just vigorously pursued the idea. Um, the uh, components consisted of a ground stream screen uh, to reduce spillover noise, the dual offset reflector system illuminating 700 by 765 feet, and then the Gregorian demonstration system. This was mainly because of some skeptic skepticism that the system would actually work and it was necessary to, uh, to actually build a demonstration in one. Uh, one megawatt transmitter that would be funded by, Nan uh, by uh, NASA and a dual beam capability for the 430 megahertz in Kieran Scudder radar so that you could transmit either from the carriage house or from the uh, dual reflector system and a resetting of the primary sector to two millimeters. There's a list here of the critical people that were involved in the design and execution of the upgrading and uh, I'm not going to, I don't have time to read, there, read all their names. Uh, system was completed in 1997. Uh, the reflectors incorporated in the 83 foot diameter dome. Um, and you can see the, in the lower left, you can see the ground screen. Um, and in the, uh, in the middle, you can see the interior of the dome showing the two reflectors and the receiver cabin with the res receivers and the transmitter at the top, in the top. I wanted to comment that at the same time as the Gregorian upgrade was taking place, uh, we were building the, uh, a new visitor center or a visitor center at the base of T12. Uh, this was um, basically organized by Daniel Altshuler, who was the director of the observatory at the time and was in, been an extremely successful uh, endeavor uh, with uh, over 100,000 visitors and students um, uh, coming coming each year. And just uh, the big, <clears throat> uh, the planetary radar uh, was a big, uh, got a tremendous advantage from the Gregorian upgrade. And you could now um, image uh, asteroids with high, uh, quite high fidelity. And this is just an image of 19, a series of images of 1998 CS1. Uh, they're actually in a Doppler, delayed Doppler images, although they look uh, uh, close to what you might expect, expect the asteroid might look like. Um, 
and you can take images like this and convert them uh, into a three di three dimensional models and a series of models of both nearest asteroids and main belt asteroids as shown on the on the right. This has been the main effort of the um, of the planetary radar system over the last uh, couple of decades. Um, in 19, 2004, uh, an L-band, the 7-beam L-band alpha system was installed on the telescope. And you can see on the image at the right, it was built by the Australian Telescope National Facility of the CSIRO. Uh, <clears throat> the alphas, the, you know, just, uh, initiated a large number of surveys of the sky. It was the extra galactic H1 surveys the galactic uh, uh, H1 in solar medium surveys, and of course, P alpha uh, uh, searches for uh, pulsars and later fast radio bursts. Uh, of course, we had to build new equipment to go along. We suddenly had now 14 channels, uh, two polarizations from seven horns, and you had to build uh, multi, um, uh, lot a lot of spectral processing, a large, very large spectral processing system that was built by an independent uh, uh, designer called Je Jeff Mock at the time, who had a lab in his house in San Francisco and uh, built, built the system. And finally, uh, these, these surveys actually uh, had an enormous number of people uh, working on them, uh, both scientists, uh, graduate students, uh, undergraduates, and this is just to demonstrate uh, one group, the undergraduate alfalfa, uh, related to the alfalfa survey led by Ricardo Giovanelli and Martha Haynes, that there was a separately NSF funded uh, undergraduate alfalfa workshops uh, funded by, uh, organized by Becky Koopman, Tom Balak and Saren Higdon. And this just shows an image of the attendees at uh, one of those workshops. And I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you, Don. As usually, we always learn new things from Arecibo when we're talking to you, and that was amazing. I, I cry a little bit. There has been uh, questions in the chat about the availability of your book. Could you give us some details about how, when and how it could be available? Um, I've been working on the book for quite some time. Um, I do have a, a publisher um but i still have um roughly about three chapters to go um and mainly bringing up, up to um, related to the gregorian upgrading and what happened after that and so i'm hoping that uh, will be completed sometime in the first half of uh, next year uh, so by the plan is by late april but i'm not making i can't make any promises <laughs> we will be waiting for that <laughs> Uh, to remember to everyone, this event Sorry, you. will be published in our website, in Arecibo Science. Thank you, Don. This is Hector, if you want to take the lead now. Eliana, your sound cut out for a minute. Can you repeat that? Um, sorry about that. I was saying that this event is going to be published in our web page and as well as all the launch talks that we have host during this year. The web page is arecibosciences.org. And thank you, Don, again for this amazing talk. And now, I, Hector, if you can take the lead. Thank you very much, Eliana and Don. That was great. Thank you for that nice history of the Aros Observatory. <clears throat> as uh, Eliana, <clears throat> sorry, as Eliana said, um, you can find more information about the talks and um, in our website uh, at civilscience.org. We also have a YouTube channel where we've been putting our uh, lunchtime talks, and this will be uh, included there as well. Um, as I said before, I wanted to give you some um, information about uh, different um, events and activities that ASAP is, uh, is doing currently. We've done several things since uh, last year, since the collapse, but uh, right now we're uh, focusing on uh, three things that I will talk about. Uh, one is that we're currently fostering a, a resolution in Congress that uh, encourages the NSF, the National Science Foundation, uh, NASA, and other federal agencies 
to study means of replacing the scientific capabilities um, that we lost, um, uh, the receiver observatory, hopefully using um, state-of-the-art technologies at the site. Uh, this resolution is uh, supposed to be introduced in Congress this week or in a few days um, by Representative Jennifer Gonzalez Colon from Puerto Rico, and um, it has bipartisan support. And so we hope that uh, when this comes out, um, that you contact your representative, uh, both in Congress and the Senate, to ask them for their support uh, to support this resolution. We'll keep you informed about this uh, we'll, when we hear when it's uh, actually introduced. We'll send out uh, an email uh, blast uh, to ask for your support to uh, uh, contact your representative. Um, the other thing that we have been have been doing uh, recently is uh, drafting a document explaining our position in response to the recommendations from the Decadal Survey on Astronomy and Astrophysics 2020, also known as Astro 2020, uh, regarding the RSU Observatory. Um, uh, Mike Nolan, one of the other um, elected uh, board members, uh, representative from the planetary um, uh, science side, will read a statement that we have uh, summarizing our position so if you can uh, take it away, Mike. All right. Hello. Yes, I'm Mike Nolan. Um, I was at the observatory for 20 years as a staff member. Um, I went there in 1995 in order to do uh, radar observations of asteroids with the idea that it would eventually uh, inform space missions. And so the uh, OSIRIS-REx mission to the asteroid Bennu is on its way home with its sample. And that was based on observations we did starting in 1999. So the, uh, I'll read the board policy statement. It's actually longer than I remembered. Uh, board policy statement, uh, 1st of December, 2021, Arecibo assessing the loss of the telescope, potential future for the observatory. Over the last six decades, the Arecibo Observatory, which is its 305 meter, 1000 foot telescope has been among the most productive and admired US science facilities. And its location in Puerto Rico has given it the a particular visibility and prestige internationally. It has facilitated community engagement in three key areas of radio science, astronomy, planetary radar, and atmospheric science. This synthesis of science, methods, facilities, and communities has given Arecibo Observatory a unique significance, strength, and depth of accomplishment. This multidisciplinary and multi-community character has proven difficult for other US science institutions to evaluate overall, and partial assessments and viewpoints remain an obstacle for the observatory. The loss of the Arecibo 305 meter telescope on December 1st, 1920, 2020, uh, leaves the three communities without the principal instrument for conducting their science. While other instruments and facilities are available, no U.S. instrument provides even a fraction of Arecibo's capabilities, and other facilities and instruments are already in major use by their own communities. Thus, the loss of the Arecibo instrument not only threatens the scientific progress of its user communities, but also the research and educational activities that sustain those communities, as well as sustain their members who will need to find other research or employment. The loss of its community would further slow progress were a replacement instrument to become available. The loss of this telescope is not only a threat to US science, but a threat to US scientific prestige. US prestige in radio astronomy is, for example, under immediate threat by the fast telescope in Southern China. Compared to the 305 meter Arecibo instrument, it has similar sensitivity and somewhat more sky coverage, but with major drawbacks. It has no radars, making it useful for, useless for Arecibo-like planetary and atmospheric studies. Its sensitive is a narrow frequency bound. In addition, it is available to US users only on a limited, partial, and uncertain basis. The Disciplinary Science Panel of the National Academy's Decadal Survey on Astronomy and Astrophysics, Astro 2020, found Arecibo irreplaceable for addressing the science question, what are the mass and spin distributions of neutron stars and stellar black holes? They found it offering unique capabilities relative to other US facilities for addressing three other science questions and having a supporting role in addressing 10 further science questions. Assessments from the other two disciplinary decadal surveys, that would be planetary science and the, the one that ends up being atmospheric science, are not yet available. Another key Astro 2020 goal was to enhance community engagement with astronomy. 
Arecibo's Angel Ramos Foundation Visitor Center has been a model for this, quote, with its outreach to hundreds of thousands of Puerto Ricans and visitors, its, its quote, promotion of demographic diversity in STEM, unquote, and its impact on post-secondary post education. A community of Puerto Rican radio scientists now pursue professions on the island and abroad. Mainland faculty who have brought students to Arecibo have founded a beacon of inspiration and PhDs in many thousands have depended on its science. So the, the, uh, in conclusion, the Arecibo Science Advocacy Partnership supports a full and comprehensive evaluation of the significance and potential future accomplishments of the Arecibo Observatory. It supports the design, construction, and secure future, secure future operation of a major new modernized Arecibo telescope that will serve its three radio science communities on the island and the mainland for decades to come. Thank you, Mike. Um, you know, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm, my name is Hector Ache. I'm a professor of astronomy at Yale, uh, born and raised in Puerto Rico, and uh, have used Arecibo Observatory for my research. Um, another thing that uh, we are doing is trying to draw support from the, uh, for the uh, observatory from a wide range of uh, stakeholders through, social, through a social media campaign. Uh, so be on the lookout for our, our relatively new Twitter accounts and, and, and Facebook and Instagram pages. So uh, again, you can get more information on that uh, from our website, which is us, uh, arecibo-science.org. And again, you can always uh, sign up for ASAP or to get um, emails from ASAP. Uh, and again, if you want to uh, help with the advocacy, of the Arecibo Observatory or um, be part of any of our four committees, please do uh, go ahead and sign up. Yeah, I think that um, concludes our event for today. And keep an eye on the, um, on the emails and communication from ASAP to uh, let you know about the uh, congressional resolution and other activities. Thank you very much. <laughs>